hybrid grading approach. What's up, HGA community? We've done a few of these, and honestly, they just keep getting better and better and better. And most of this episode, I'm going to leave the cage because he has a little bit of a beef to pick with Mr. <laughs> Smith here. Uh, but but before we get into that, you know, we have the esteemed Mr. Rod Smith here today. He's two-time Super Bowl winner with the Denver Broncos and the first undrafted player to reach 10,000 receiving yards. Listen to that, guys. Undrafted to Super Bowl champion. And a lot of you guys are listening and waiting in the queue. I think that's a lot of us in life now undrafted, trying to pull ourselves up by the bootstrings. We had COVID last year. Who knows how that's affected people? I think today's going to be a really inspiring and educational conversation. Uh, and I'm going to let Cage take it away. But first, I want to hear from you, Rod. What was that like? You know, we all go to college. We want to play. We play you play a sport uh, really, really well. And then you come out undrafted. Did you come out with a chip on your shoulder? What was that experience like? Oh, absolutely. Um, first of all, I appreciate you guys for having me on. And um, um, I know put it together kind of a last second deal, but it worked out. And so I, I, I'm always grateful to do these type of interviews. I don't do many of them, as I said before. So shout out to my man Lucas and, and his team for putting it all together. But uh, um, yeah, you know, I went to a small school. I went to Division II school. When I first got there, we were NAI. So we shifted Division II when I first got there. So you know, the cards are stacked against you because they, they grade you based off a of talent level, based on where you went to school. And so, you know, um, I, you know, you break all the school records and conference records and all those things. And, you know, you don't you don't play on TV, which is when you grow up as a young high school player. You want to get to those the Notre Dame USC type thing where you see 75, 100,000 people in the stands. You don't get that. You got 5000 people in the stands and 17 of them, you know, <laughs> so it's, it's, it's different. Um but for me, I um, I just knew that I was going to put in the work uh, no matter where I am. If I'm in college, when I get to the pros, if I got to the pros, I was just going to put in the work. And that was my whole MO. That's in my entire life, man. I grew up with absolutely nothing. And I said, you know what? I'm going to make something out of the life I have. I love it. Listen, let me say this. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's you. Day to you. You know, you have, uh, you know you're a family guy. So, I mean, listen, the undrafted stuff, that's a crazy thing. It just really is. I'm a Raider fan, so, you know, they told me Rod Smith's coming on. And I'm like, oh, come on, anybody else, anybody. <laughs> but then I thought to myself, I'm like, you know what? This guy embodies a lot of the stuff that we bring as a podcast, a lot of things that we bring into the hobby, you know, a lot of my own personal stuff as well. And um, forget about just that you're undrafted, right? You come in with a chip on your shoulder. Um, I love those Hollywood Disney type stories, right? So we had Brian, uh, we had Brian Mitchell on uh, yeah. last week. We spoke to him, right? I mean, good dude, great dude, great no, guy, man. right? Just like, yeah, a, like a real great guy, great to chat with him. And obviously, one of the best return men, if not the best return men ever to play in the game, right? Should be and, in the Hall of Fame too. Ah, uh, and so should you. But we'll get. Tell him I said it. <laughs> it's a it's a very different game now, right? And that's part of it, right? So so um, but we'll get to that. We'll get to your stats because I'm going a different way. It's it's more this, right? So you come out of college, right? Obviously, you know, you, you're, you're, you're not drafted. Brian Mitchell, he played quarterback in college and never returned a punt ever, right? So he comes out in this first preseason game. He, first time they put him back there, they say, and runs it back for a touchdown. Do you remember, you, you know, you didn't get drafted, but obviously you signed undrafted with, with the Broncos. You remember your first play? You remember your first? Well, like, your I, can, first I can tell you my, my first regular season play of my career, yep. my first, not my first play, my first not catch. First I'll, catch. I'll yep. say that. Yep. My first catch was a Hail Mary game winning touchdown against the Redskins, the Redskins. and Brian Mitchell. And Brian Mitchell's team. So, I mean, it's amazing the, how we do this, reason, right? <laughs> the reason being is Brian Mitchell is the reason why I had to catch it because he was killing us on special teams. <laughs> yeah, so Brian and I talked, we talked about that, man. I think he broke all kinds of records on us that day and Luckily, we won the game, uh, and uh, that was my first ever NFL catch. Uh, Daryl Green was out there. I don't say over Daryl Green. People say they're over Daryl yeah. Green, but that was my first ever catch. Hail, Hail Mary game winning touchdown with no time on the clock. So that's a good way to introduce yourself to the NFL. He shortchanged it, guys. It, was, it wasn't just a touchdown. It was a 43-yard touchdown. His first catch ever, 38-31 victory. Pretty pretty crazy stuff. But here's – I mean, we, we'll go through all your accomplishments. Here's the thing that I love the most, right? So our podcast, we don't have any generous benefactors. We're not the first round draft pick. We don't have anybody who's, you know, who's staking us. We don't have any rich daddies or silver spoons in our mouths, right? A lot of people do. But you know, we are real loyal. You tell the tell folks watching this how many teams you played for? One. Uno. One team. 
Was yeah. part of that because they took a chance on you and you said, you know what, I'm going to give it back? Or just, you know, he said, you love the culture there. You got to play with Elway. What, what went into staying on one team for that long? You, you know what? Um, uh, a, a lot of the stuff you guys stand for is what I really, really love. And, you know, you talk about loyalty and culture. And, and to be honest with you, when you're an NFL player, this is for all the young guys who are going to be listening to this later on or watching it. Um, you are a business. And so the way I handled my business was I always structured my contracts to where there was always a benefit where I could make a call to hopefully stay where I am. I didn't want to go anywhere else. I had already built my name up and I had built a reputation up, especially after my first year starting. Well, my first two years started, we won a Super Bowl. So I'm a back-to-back Super Bowl champion. My name is, 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 is growing in the community. I do tons of stuff with boys and girls clubs and all other kind of organizations. I don't like to pat myself on the back for that. I just do it because – those organizations helped me. Boys and Girls Club was huge in my life growing up. So um, there was a time when my contract was was kind of not in limbo because I had structured it where they were going to pay me what I was worth or it was going to hurt their cap if they got rid of me. See, you got to handle business. So and I made it where it was more beneficial to the team based off my efforts to keep me. And so that's what I wanted to do. I didn't want to move. I didn't want to go anywhere else. And uh, after my my first year on the practice squad, you still got to make the team every year. I did take a trip in, in the offseason to Seattle. It was raining. Jimmy Smith was there. Jimmy and I talked about this on a radio show I did not too long ago. Jimmy Smith was in town. Uh, he was with, you know, he eventually became a Jaguars all time great. But Jimmy Smith and I both were unemployed at the same time looking for a job. And we was in Seattle in the rain trying to have us run routes. And it was crazy. So, we talk about that, just how together, I think he and I both have like 25,000 yards receiving now, I know, after the fact. <laughs> well, I mean, go ahead, Andrew. Well, it, it's okay, but I, I'm curious. Like, I played sports my whole life. I, I didn't get to play professionally. It was always my dream. But you got drafted by an organization that uh, they didn't have a culture of winning, but now looking back, you had, and I didn't tell you this, Cage, um, Terrell Davis was one of the first cards I collected. I love Terrell Davis. So you're John Elway, Terrell Davis, and I'm fascinated by culture. What was that like coming into a rookie, but being in a culture of, did it feel like it was just winners there all around? You know what it was? I'll tell you what, Chip. This is what shifted. My rookie year, well, Wade Phillips was the head coach. Jim Fossil was the offensive coordinator. And the culture was completely different. Mr. Bowling was still the owner. What happened after my first year, and this is why I was a, I was a free agent as well. I was on the practice squad the first year, and I'm a free agent the next year. Coach Shanahan came in the next year. The second year, Coach Shanahan became the head coach. He came from, of course, the Bill Walsh era, which, which had culture with the 49ers. And so when Coach Shanahan came to the Broncos, everything literally changed for the entire organization. The way we met, the way we went on the road, our, our hotel – things, the way we went on planes, buses, everything changed. Coach Shanahan literally and Mr. Bowling orchestrated the change of culture. And of course, John Elway was there and he was always a great player, but he was on a player with an organization and a culture that wasn't conducive to actually winning consistently. You know, the Broncos that went to, you know, tons of Super Bowls and they, you know, it's blue collar, grit, grind, all that. And that's what we had on our team. And that was the people that they went and picked up was people who were like that. Because, of course, we go get Gary Zimmerman, we go, who's a Hall of Famer. <laughs> we get Terrell Davis, sixth round. Shannon Sharp was like 11-round draft pick. Most people don't know. Shannon was already there. So Shannon was a part of the shift of culture. He was a winner, obviously, Hall of Famer now, of course. And then there was Ray Crockett. And then there's Steve Atwater, who's a Hall of Famer. And then eventually you start bringing in the pieces uh, that, that, that actually led us to be dominant. For three years, there, no one could really touch us. And – uh, it was because of, like you said, the shift in culture. Mr. Bowling gave Coach Shanahan and his staff free reign to go and get the guys that they needed and, and build the stuff off the field was really where the culture shifted. It wasn't necessarily on the field. You already had winners. You already had hustlers, guys who were grinders, you know, undrafted guys. Eddie Mack, my man Eddie Mack was what, like a fourth-round pick, and he had got cut as well. So he brought in guys who were easily who would work hard. But he changed up the way we met, the times we met, how we stayed in hotels, how we went to the, how we went about our business. That changed. Do you have an example of that that you that sticks out that you remember that you're like now looking back, you're like, oh, yeah, it's so I, odd. Yeah, I I remember um, I was at an event, a business event, because I do a lot of different uh, businesses. I was at a business event, and a guy who played for the Buffalo Bills uh, was at the event, and he was kind of running. He was a part of the the operations of this event. 
And um, and they were talking about hotel rooms. And it was like, well, we got you a roommate. I'm like, what are you talking about? I said, like, dude, I don't do roommates. <laughs> oh, man, I'm not standing in a room with another grown man. That, But he was like, well, in the NFL, we have roommates. I said, well, that's different. You played in Buffalo. I played <laughs> in Denver. When Coach Shanahan came, we all had our own room. Everybody had their own room. And his thinking was everybody gets prepared for the game different. And so that stuck with me my entire life that I get ready for the game different. You might be a guy who wants to look at, watch movies and, and listen to loud music all night. Me, I might want to do it completely different, be in complete silence and meditate. So we literally, every hotel we went into, we took over the whole hotel. Mr. Bolin, of course, approved all this. And we all had our own rooms so we could prepare for the games differently. That, from a culture standpoint, was a huge shift in the way we started doing business. And when I told him that, he's like, man, I can't believe that. I said, well, remember, y'all lost four straight Super Bowls. We won two straight. That's the difference. So <laughs> that's that's the kind of my mindset with it is you, you create an atmosphere of success and it's going to happen. You know what's funny? I see the like we've met with a few guys, but I also I love the TNT show with Shaq, Kenny, Ernie, and Charles. It yeah. seems that competitors are competitors are competitors. Always. It seems that Rod is just as competitive now, telling you guys you lost four Super Bowls, we won two, <laughs> even now, and, and you can't you can't change it. That's awesome. It's cool to see. Oh yeah, no. So it's it's um you know as an athlete that especially when you get to that level because it's extremely hard when he asks about. You know, going from, you know, Division II college and playing in the pros, you know, it's a lifelong dream to play in the pros. I don't care where I had it come from, but it's difficult. It's very hard. And I tell – I, I mentor a couple of young guys. Matter of fact, Benny Fowler and I was out working out. He's with the 49ers now, young guy who's with the Broncos, undrafted. So he he sought me to get information on how he could stay in this game and, and longevity in the league, and and he's done a good job. You know, he, hopefully he'll get a shot to, to stick and stay again this year. But one of the things for me – that was just so so evident was was you got to handle your business, man. You got to let nowadays there's so many distractions with all the phones and the tablets and the social media and all this other stuff that guys get distracted very, very easy. And uh, a few young guys that are uh, that I mentor, I tell them, I said, listen, man, let me tell you something. The hardest thing you ever do is make it to the NFL. I said, so if your agent or your family, or your friends and your old coaches told you how great you are, and this is now I said the NFL don't give a damn about you and all that. They have a business to run and it's big business. I said, it's hard to get there. And I said, here's the most difficult part. It's even harder to stay. <laughs> you can get in. Look how many guys get in and they don't stay. And so for me, uh, to Cage's point, you know, playing in Denver for 14 years and staying there, of, of course, this is still my home now. Um, you know, it was very difficult to stay in one spot that long. But, you know, God, God willing, it, it worked out. I love it. I love it. And you're right. I mean, there's so much. The competitors are competitors. It's funny. And. So we we've talked to a, a a bunch of a bunch of NFL players, and we talked to Irving Fryer, you know, in the old uh, you know fraternity of wide receivers. And it's funny because I asked him a question that I don't think I'm going to ask you. And I'm going to tell you why. Right? I asked him a question of, hey, you know, if you could have anybody throw you a pass, you know, anybody in the past, I said, hey, Y.A. Tittle, if you name him, whatever, or in the future, I was expecting him to say like Tom Brady throw me a pass, whatever it was. And you know what? He's, he he took it a different way. And I love Irving. Irving's going to hang out with, with Andrew down in Mexico. They go golfing together. So I'm serious. He's going down for his mom's birthday. If you want to go down, Andrew, he, he's a golf guy. He'll caddy for you. He'll do all that stuff, right? So, but he, you know what he said? He, he you know, a, a lot of Irving Fryer, it's, it's, I played at a different time. Jerry Rice played. And he basically said, you know what I'd like? I would have liked to have had the two guys that Jerry Rice had thrown to him throw to me. I want Steve Young and Joe Montana, right? So you were lucky. He had who? Uh, Eason? Grogan? I mean, who did he have thrown to him in, in for the Patriots, right? So so you had John Elway, right? Yeah. You had John Elway throwing you the ball. I mean, that's pretty awesome, right? I mean, like, this, you know, a lot of what I ask about is, like, your situation, right? I know no matter where we put you, you are going to succeed because that's obviously for – that's just you. But it's nice to come into a situation where you got Elway throwing you the ball, right? Absolutely. Yeah. You know what? Um, it's scary, <laughs> to be perfectly honest with you, um, this guy pretty much owned the city that you're in, you know, just by who he is and how he handled himself his whole career. And here you are, undrafted guy coming in, trying to make the football team. And, uh, you know, I'm not in the huddle with him. I'm four for 15. Right? Whatever the last person on depth chart, that's where I am. So I'm not even really getting in the huddle with him hardly at all, you know, my, my rookie year. And um, but through making the team, you know, over over time and, and, and making the team, um, and I get in there, I would, I, I, and it's kind of crazy because I would get in in what I call stunt double routes. 
I would play the X position when they knew for a fact the ball wasn't coming to that guy. <laughs> It'd be like a clear out go route or a post route or something like that. But I didn't care. I was in the huddle with him. I would tell Anthony Miller, hey, man, I'll, I'll take that one. You don't want that one. He didn't get the ball, right? And so he would let me get in there. And, bro, I would be so fired up to just be in the huddle next to Elway and, and all the guys because we, we had a real close group. And, uh, you know, I was running those go routes like I was getting the ball. And Coach was like, who the hell is this running so fast? And it was like, oh, that's me, Coach. And I literally <laughs> found moments, man, just to get in the huddle with him because, you know, he was a legend. And, and, and you know, he had lost several Super Bowls before we got there. And the goal was, you know, people say, well, you know, you want to do this for John. I'm like, no, I want to do it for me. <laughs> and I want John to benefit, right? So, but, you know, when Terrell and, and Howard Griffin, man, I can just start naming all the guys and Tommy Naylor, my buddy Tommy, and just our line and, and Stink and all those guys, man. And Tony Jones, the late, great Tony Jones, man, we had a, a group of guys that cared about each other, right? Even to this day, we have a we have a text group right now. It's got 19 guys on it. It should be more, but we can't figure out how to get more guys on it. But we literally text each other. Like yesterday, of course, Father's Day, what happens? Through the text, everybody's, you know, a lot of the dads and and we one of our coaches, Greg Robinson, is sick right now, and we're praying for Greg. And I just went through a major thing last week, and and, and all the guys are there. You know, their their condolences and all kind of stuff that you know we're just so close still to this day, and no one's going to take that away from us. Well, listen, I have to tell you, and it's just for honesty, I don't like Elway. <laughs> I am a, I'm a Raider fan, so you, Rod, so you, you destroyed us. But yeah, it goes even deeper, Rod. I'm also a Yankee fan. He could have been a Yankee. I mean, yep. they, you know, he there are Yankee Elway cards on there, so he hurt me. He hurt me deep, Rod. <laughs> but anyway, it is what it is. You know, I mean, it is. How about the front office? How about the front office of the Broncos? Right, we give front offices credit. I mean, they got you. As an undrafted free agent, Terrell in the sixth round. I mean, Shannon Sharp was there a little longer, obviously, but oh, like eleventh round or whatever craziness he is. I mean, you got to give some credit to those guys behind the scenes. Obviously, you know it, it's it's a great thing to see it all come together like that because you guys were dominant. I mean, the years where you won the Super Bowl, there was nobody touching you. You could just pencil you guys in, and you were taking those two Super Bowls. It didn't make a difference. And you combine that culture from your new coach with obviously the front office for doing their job. I mean, I don't even want to talk about who the Raiders drafted in those years. Forget about it. But, I mean, that, that's it. You have to give credit where credit's due, right? Absolutely. And a lot of times, and this is one thing I love about Mr. Bolin. I still say this about him. You know, uh, when he passed, it hurt me a lot because I I learned uh, from, from watching him handle his business. I learned how to handle my business a little bit better. Here's a man that runs a multi-billion dollar business. This is a, basically, I think the Broncos right now are worth well over $2 billion. And um, I used to study Mr. Bowling. Literally, I used to study Mr. Bowling because he – think about it. For him to own the team, but then the coach comes in and wants to change all this stuff, he okayed it. He had to sign off on everything that happened. The way we did things at the stadium were different. The people that they brought in – I remember John Beak was the general manager when I first got there, and John Beak was you know, a great friend of mine, and uh, Neil Dolan. Neil Dolan, I think Neil Dolan got like seven Super Bowls. People don't know who Neil Dolan is. Neil Dolan is like a, like a beast because he's with the 49ers. When they were winning, of course, that culture comes to the Broncos. Like you were saying, we just kept moving, moving the the, the, the pieces. It was individual pieces that were slowly getting put together to to help us win games. And uh, quick story: I was I was leaving the weight room with a bunch of my young guys, you know, working out and stuff like that. And um, and the young guys, of course, what are they doing? They're looking at the parking lot and they see all these nice cars. You see Champ Bailey's Aston Martin. You see so and so's car. This car. This car. This car. And at the same time, Mr. Bowling's pulling up. And he's in a Porsche Cayenne at the time. He's pulling up in a Porsche Cayenne. And um, I said, dude, y'all focus on the wrong thing. I said, see that little skinny guy over there? <laughs> he should focus on him. I said, remember, he paid the money to buy every car in his lot. <laughs> I said, these guys got a little bit of money. But I said, that's the guy you should be studying. And uh, and I remember at the end of my career, man, I was, I was retired about a year. And I was out watching practice. And I get this tap on the shoulder. And you're like, wait a minute. I'm like. And it's, and it's one of the one of the guys who works in the building. He said, Mr. Bowling wants to see you. And I'm scared. I'm like, what the hell did I do? Right. <laughs> like, what, what did I do wrong? And I'm sitting there like kind of terrified. I'm like, well, I said, I don't work for him anymore, so he can't fire me. So uh, but I'm just out here watching it. And, and, but Mr. Bowling just wanted to have a talk. Literally, one of my greatest moments of my career as a Bronco was my 45 minute talk after I had retired for two years, sitting there talking to Mr. Bowling about the future of the Broncos, you know, asking him about. You know, you know, have you thought about successors? Because that's the stuff that I needed to hear. I wanted to hear how he did that. I remember his son was was working with the with the landscape guy. And he was cutting grass. I'm like, wait a minute, this dude's the future potential future 
owner of the Broncos, he's cutting grass. And I asked him about that. And he's like, you know what? You want to learn all the aspects of your business. And so I took that for the business that I do. I learned the aspects. I don't want to do them all, but I at least want to know them. But that was one of the best 45 minutes of my life, man, just sitting there with a billionaire and we're having a regular conversations. And he's telling me about plays I made that I couldn't remember. Remember, I took hits for a living, so I didn't remember. But he remembered it. And, and these were moments in his in his ownership that he, you know, uh, he just really embraced, you know, those the times we won big and things like that, man. So it was real special for me. You know, so if you guys don't know, Rod, officially retired in 2007. Here you have this conversation in 2008. I was just going to ask you, so I'm glad you went there with Future. You know, the transition from playing to what the future of your life looks like isn't easy for a lot of players, but you've done it so successfully and gracefully. Yeah, well, what's your been like? It's, it's, uh, it's hard, man. I, you know, I, I, ha I have some friends, and it's not easy for me by no means either, but, you know, I'm constantly, uh, you know, my, my grandsons are with me now. Right, right. If, if I go downstairs right now, there's five – young boys between the ages of nine and 12 in my house downstairs and they're in the basement playing video games and theater and all that stuff. That's a rowdy age and, and oh, five of them at that age. Oh, I'm, I'm a, I told them if they're cool and they're quiet, I'm going to cook them breakfast. I know it's late, but they get up late. I've been up since seven. They get up at like 10 o'clock, but I told them I'm going to cook them breakfast and then I'm going to, I'm going to take them to this little jump house thing. And, uh, and then their, their friends will take them back home a little bit later today. But, um, it's been uh, for me, for me, um, uh, you, you see a lot of athletes, man, and, and it's tough. It's tough keeping up with the money and the success. And I've watched some of my friends who they were so consumed with football, they forgot one day it was going to end. And when when that spotlight kind of is not shining on you as bright anymore, guys literally go into a dark place, they literally go into a dark place. And um, and we've studied this and. You know, vitamin D is weird because vitamin D is that thing that helps you with adrenaline. Football gives you adrenaline. When you don't have football, that means you don't have adrenaline. So people will turn to drugs or they turn to sex or they turn to different other vices to replace the adrenaline. And I'm telling all you guys, take vitamin D tablets. They help, you know, just for you to because you don't need to have that rush that you get from playing football, but you need to have something to cope uh, before you go off and do something crazy. And I had some friends who were in a dark place, but the cool thing is we got them out of that. They're doing well now because you got to handle the business. Remember, you are, you ink, and, 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 and it's hard to maintain the lifestyle that you built if you didn't prepare for it. You got to be prepared for it. You know, it's like I was preparing to stay in the NFL a long time, but I couldn't stick there in the future because if you're not getting something done right now and getting results, you're going to be out of there quickly. Remember, they're constantly looking to replace you. And uh, and I had a, a very similar story happen to me. Um, I was young in the game. I'll say this real quick. I was young in the game. I was probably about a year right after we won the Super Bowl, and I was and I was I was hurt. Remember, I'm not injured. Injured means you can't play. Hurt means you got to play through the pain. So I'm over there. I'm getting treatment on a, on a Tuesday, which is our day off. I'm over there getting treatment because you got to get treatment even if you're if you're hurt. So I'm getting treatment and I've just showered. I'm sitting in my locker, you know, kind of reflecting. You know, here I am. My Sh Shannon Sharp's locker is right in front of mine. And I'm always like, you know, how do you, how do you take the next step? How do you take the next step? And all of a sudden, I see six guys uh, turn to the right. Now, there's six guys walking in with one of the scouts. And True Love is a young, young guy. True Love, man, we're cool. I'm like, hey, man, what's up, man? Y'all working out some DBs. And I see these guys, and I'm sitting down, so they all look kind of tall. He's like, nah. He said, it's three DBs and three receivers. I was like, we don't need no receivers. He's like, no, we're looking to replace you. And I'm like, dude, what are you talking about? <laughs> And like when the guys went through, they was doing some measurements on them, getting them some gear to work out in. And he came back. He said, man, listen, every every week they bring guys in to work out. They're constantly looking to replace guys. See, I had never saw that. I never seen it happen. He was kind of joking because I was just first year star. We won Super Bowl. So he's kind of like they're looking to replace you. But I took it to heart. I said, I'm never coming back to the training room again because <laughs> we all know you can't make the club in the tub. So I'm not coming back over here for treatment ever again. And I got to stay on my grind because they're looking to replace me every week. And I literally learned that in that business, every week they're bringing in guys to replace a guy. And, 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 it's, and it's not, like I say, it's hard to get there, but it's even more difficult to stay. Rod, you just said that, but I think it's an important moment because if you think about a young player in any sport, but let's just use NFL. That's yeah. a very vulnerable po point in their career Absolutely. where they just had a lot of success. And here's someone bringing in someone to replace me. But you yeah. took that as it sounds like you took it as inspiration to get better. 
Absolutely. How but, did you how did you do that? Like wh- wh- why I, did that come so naturally to you? You know what, man? Growing up with nothing, growing up in the projects, welfare, food stamps, how I grew up, watching my mom, you know, struggle to keep food on the plate, you know, and stuff like that. But she did a good job as good as she could. And once I got to a certain point, I said, I'm going to take over this for the whole family. And I took on that ownership and it's tough. But um, that was my mentality. So I never had the mentality, oh, I've arrived. Most guys get knocked off the minute they feel they arrived, and especially in the NFL or any pro sport. Plus, with pro football, you don't have guaranteed contracts like you do in these other sports. You know, you sign a five-year deal in the NFL, your signing bonus is the only thing guaranteed. They can cut you the next week if they want to. A lot of people most don't realize people, that. Most people, people don't have a clue that they think, oh, I saw you sign a $40 million contract. They think you put $40 million in your pocket. Like, no, dude, they're going to tear this thing out, and they're going to stretch it out as long as they can. They're going to try to make it hard for you to earn that extra money, so to speak, right? Um, <laughs> funny story, you know, Coach Kubiak, that's my man. If it weren't for, you know, uh, Coach Heimerdinger, you know, uh, rest his soul, that was my guy. He taught me how to be a receiver in the NFL. But Gary Kubiak, like, was like one of my aces, man. Kubiak, um, <laughs> it was crazy. We had practice one day, right? We had just got a new receiver. He was number 14. It was black guy. And the reason I can't tell you his name, because – it happened so fast that he was in our room all of a sudden and we was having, you know, the first practice and the guy was there and we was doing pat and go warmups. And then we had our little practice. Then we had lunch and then we have a second practice. Well, when we came out for the second practice, number 14 was a white guy. I'm like, hold up. I know for a fact, cause I was going to introduce myself to him cause I didn't have time. I didn't get time to even introduce myself to the dude. He was gone. And so I went up to cool. I said, cool. I said, cool. First practice. Number 14 was a black guy. I said, what did the brother do at lunch that y'all cut him during lunch? Did he screw up a sandwich? What did he do? And Coop just fell out laughing. And, and it, honestly, a white guy was at number 14, you know, not being racial about it, but this was a fact. I didn't even know the other guy's name because he had just got there literally right before practice started. And he said, Rod, you know how this business is. They're constantly looking to replace. So me having that mentality, that's where it came from. These things actually happen. These are real results. When you see a guy get fired and they leave with that gray trash bag with all their stuff, their locker's clean. They got this great, great trash bag draped over their shoulder, and they're walking out when everybody's at practice. That is the most scariest feeling ever for me, and I never wanted to feel that. Do you think that same kind of tenacious you're looking to get replaced applies to like other sports like NBA? Absolutely. Absolutely. It does? It, it, here's the thing. It should, but you got a guaranteed contract. You, you see it a little different because when those guys sign a four or five year deal for 40, 50 million bucks, they're going to get that money unless they do something completely yep. stupid. Right. The, the, and the NBA is so jacked up, in my opinion, is jacked up because they be firing guys and still are on the books, haven't played for them two, three years. You're t- completely screwing up the financial markets for those clubs. But that's just my personal opinion. But so a guy in the, in the NBA in baseball, Major League Baseball, it's completely different. Soccer is completely different. The NFL, and they're slowly getting to um, – they don't the, – the, I think the owners will honestly fight to the death and never give guaranteed contracts. But some guys are getting smarter. Um, um, I'll, I'll, I'll take um, quarterback for the Vikings, um, Kirk Cousins. Kirk Cousins. He said, hey, mm-hmm. look, I'll take a three-year, $90 million deal fully guaranteed. So he started that 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 ball rolling like that, where guys are taking shorter contracts and fully guaranteeing the contract versus give me this six or seven year deal. And, you know, I get a big signing bonus allegedly and they're stretching it out because the rest of it is speculative money if you're on the team. So if you get hurt, you can't get fired if you're hurt. But as soon as you're healthy, they'll cut you and they save all this other money. So I think Kurt, he ain't the first one to do it, but he's one that kind of recently that kind of started that ball rolling in that direction. I love his wide receiver. I love Justin Jefferson. I was going to ask you, oh, yeah. uh, Rod, who, whose style? Who, what's? I'm not going to ask you what players you love. I want to. I want to talk a little bit about how you mentor them in a bit. But uh, who's? What style? You know, the NFL's changed so much. Watching you guys, I remember watching this Broncos team. You, Tell Davis, must have ran the ball 30 times. Now you, it's 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 running back by committee. And you could correct me if I'm wrong. Obviously, um, what style do you like of NFL now? What team catches I, your eye? You know what? T- t- today's game, honestly, it's a lot more um, misdirection. They run the spread offense. I personally hate the spread offense. I don't, and and I could be wrong, but I don't think you can run the football as good as you can. Like we just lined up and going to hit you in the mouth. Our yeah. our game was a lot more physical, to be honest. 
uh, our play action passes really work because we ran the ball so well. You know, it's easy to get play action pass when you got Terrell Davis and how Griffith leading the charge, you know, and our offensive line was, was great at giving you a scene, giving you a lane. And so as a receiver, we, we did everything based off of timing. And, uh, and these guys today, man, they're, they're quick as a cat. Some of these linemen are huge and they're fast. And so the game is a lot more – to me, I think it plays faster. Uh, it's a lot more of a college-style game. That's why you see guys coming straight out of college and they're, they're adapting pretty quickly. Well, the college style has adapted um, those players to play in the pros as soon as they leave, you know. And so – but I like the style we played with. We played a little bit more smash-mouth football, scoring one as near as high as they are now. But here's one thing that most people don't pay attention to. The rules are completely different. Um, honestly, if we'd have played with the rules they have now, we could have played easy another two more years because there's a lot less physical, yep. um, which in some regards needed because, trust me, I was a part of the, the get knocked out crew. I got knocked yep. out a few times. And so you're trying to protect guys. Um, the return game, like you mentioned, Brian Mitchell, like I say, one of my one of my favorite people, man, just meeting Brian and doing some of the stuff with him at some of the golf tournaments and stuff. Great guy. Um, but, you know, the return game is not as evident as it was back then. You know, especially punt and kickoff return is yep. always touchbacks and stuff like that. So I believe in letting teams earn uh, every yard. And uh, nowadays, you know, guys can get ran over on defense and it's a penalty on the offensive guy, like weird stuff yeah. like that. So th that keeps drives going, that keeps scoring up. And I, I like the way where it, where it used to be. Would it, if we could have had a little bit more regulation, you know, so not so many helmet to helmets, uh, it would have been a little bit better. A little middle ground between where we are now and where we were. Let me ask you. Uh, your future. You love mentoring people. We're going to wrap with this. And, and Cage had to drop off. So today, today's really Father's Day for him. So his one son's graduating uh, elementary, his daughter's graduated middle school. So there's that. Let me ask you, you know, what are you up to professionally? I know you mentioned you had a radio show. I could see why that was successful. But I, I think if I'm catching your vibe, you enjoy mentoring yeah. younger, younger, younger Rod Smiths. Uh, younger athletes, younger professionals. I, you know, I do it in two different aspects. Actually, I mentor people in business. I have a business mentorship thing. I don't do it really formally yet. I have some pro programs and products that are going to be coming out. You know, I wrote my book. You can probably, you can probably see it, the Rod Effect. My book. It's a, it's not an autobiography. It really tells a little bit about the mentality you got to have to go. I was a big dreamer, man, growing up, and and I was a dreamer. So I took this this acronym of dreaming, the words dreaming, and I each one of them is a principle that I live by. I use it in sports and I use it in business. And so I mentor people in sports and in business. And some of the sports guys, uh, Warren Jackson, he's a young guy from Colorado, uh, Colorado State. He's actually with the Broncos. He's wearing number 80. And so he's a young guy and he's trying to make it. You know, he was an undrafted free agent. I said, man, listen, it's going to be difficult. And so, you know, we and uh, we've had some conversations I, you know, from Brandon Marshall. You know, Brandon Marshall ended up having over 900 and some catches. I used to mentor mm -hmm. Brandon and, you know, Eddie Royal. And like I said, Benny, you know, I don't I don't seek a lot of guys. Some guys seek me, but I love to help, you know. And uh, like I say, I, I, I know there's a part of football that will never change. And that's that grit and that grind and the hustle part that ain't going to never change. You know, being able to block, get yourself in position where the receivers today, they don't block and don't challenge me on that because I can grab all kind of tape. They they only want to catch passes, and that's not how you win championships. You got to you know be a part of the gotta block. Yeah, you got to be a part of the whole football game, and that's why I was telling you know Warren and a few other guys that we'll have a group. Man, we have eight, ten guys out there sometimes. You know, receivers that I'm you know working with. I don't charge these guys. You know, right now is not a thing where I'm trying to get paid. I just want somebody to have a chance to play in this league as long as I did, or even just get one year, two years. Uh, Joe, Joe Parker is a real cool guy, a good friend of mine. He played up in Wyoming, short dude, but Joe is quick as a cat. He can play. I want a team to give him a chance. I just, I mean, Broncos, anybody, just give him a chance. God, watch this kid work, and he's willing to put in the work and do that. And so these guys, a couple of guys I worked with with Landau last year, one of them got drafted by the Rams in the fourth round, uh, Jacob out of uh, uh, University of Central Florida. Another one, Austin, he got picked up by the Raiders. He's a free agent for the Raiders. I said, man, listen. I don't care if you play for the Raiders. If you need help, you call me. I can help your game over the phone. All I need to do is see the videotape of how you're running your routes, and I can help you. So I just want guys to live their, their, their dream like I did. And it's short-lived, whether it's 14 years like I did or it's four years. I just want to give them the mentality uh, of what it takes. Austin, who's a, a young tight end for the Broncos, I think it's his third year. He was an undrafted free agent. He went through that same process with me three years ago. 
he texts me is cool because he texts me videotape of him in practice the other day killing a safety on an route on a, on a route that I showed him how to set it up. I said, man, if you do this every time, they can never know which way you're going. And he killed him. He said, man, hey, I'm still using your stuff. It still works. I said, hey, keep killing him. So that's what I enjoy doing, man. And, um, you know, for me, there's always, you know, different ways to make money and all that stuff. But I like helping people and show them there's a different side of, of, of your sport and your business. But you just got to see it from a different lens sometimes. And so that's what I love doing. I love it. Um, and guys, so there's people right now that are, you know, they're waiting to get their cards graded. This is in, in between a queue. So the book is called The Rod Effect. Yeah. Uh, biography, so to speak. Uh, I love stories. You know, I once heard this quote be quoted, and I'll paraphrase it here. There's so much benefit to be learned from stories of other people. Yeah. Right? There's Absolutely. so much to be learned. And, and I, I love reading. I love reading stories of others. Let's talk a little bit about Tom Brady and talk about his story a little. Man, played against him. <laughs> played right. against him a lot. We would dominate the Patriots. And then all of a sudden, uh, it wasn't all of a sudden. They literally built, they built a, a, a dynasty, honestly. Go ahead. Is, is, about well, Tom. well, I mean, is is he just the case of where hard work meets opportunity? Is that what the case with Thomas? Because he's the hardest worker, but undoubtedly he's the organization. Bill Belichick, how professionally that's run. Uh, what's your take on that? Being an insider, seeing that from from the inside out. I hate and love Tom Brady. <laughs> Most people hate him because he wins all the time. I said, you don't want yeah. to win, beat him. And we used to beat them. That was the thing. We used to beat them when we played the Patriots. And it wasn't a matter of beating Tom. It's their system. And mm -hmm. that organization doesn't win without, honestly, Bill Belichick. Their team changes over just like everybody else's. And you see people come through that organization, and, and they're not these crazy household names like everybody thinks. But their culture, you know, they call it the Patriot way or whatever that means. And, honestly, they dominated the game uh, based off of that, that, that philosophy. But it's amazing how when Tom goes to Tampa – and he pulls some guys literally off the street and they go and win the Super Bowl. And that the aura of Tom Brady is, is absolutely amazing. I, you, I, you will never hear me really say anything bad about Tom Brady because of I have to respect the game. He's got a, you know, almost two hands full of Super Bowl rings. So you can't, you can say whatever you want about him. But at 40, almost 45 years old, he's still playing at a high level. And, he, and he's an anomaly of such. And, and I'm always going to take my hat off to him. Do you think, and tell me if this is right, it's just a theory. I'm 31, I'm learning life, but I've learned, uh, even, even adults have this, belief, like the power of belief. Absolutely. I, that, I love that, yeah. If you, if you don't, and, and this is what, honestly, I'll tell you this right now, I'm working on that with my grandsons, is building their belief in themselves. Some people call it confidence. Some people call it cocky, depending on which side of the spectrum you're on. Yes. Mm -hmm. But if you don't believe in you and what you're cult ult ultimately going for, you'll never get there. And most people, and what I've noticed is they don't have a goal. They just, they kind of in the moment, they say they want to be successful. And when you ask them to define it, they can't. And defining it, especially in athletes as, 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 as a, let's just use football, the, the ultimate thing is right there. You see those right there? Right. The, the, I that saw them from the it. second we jumped on. At the minute, that, that's why I, you know, I had their replicas. The, the team didn't give us any. I didn't like that. But anyway, their replicas, and I love it because no one can ever take it away. But the goal from jump for every squad is that. How can we get some Super Bowls under your belt? See, I knew once we won one, no one can ever not call me a Super Bowl champion at the end of the yeah. day. And so when it comes to your belief, you got to believe in yourself. And, you know, for me, it was – like you guys were saying, you know, being undrafted, I just I got to believe in myself. I'm do am I good enough to make this team? And I have to have a core belief that's completely different than anybody who drafted me or who put these labels on me, like the media does. They put these labels on you, and you got to learn to get rid of those labels very quickly. And what do you see? And what do you believe in yourself as far as going forward? And my 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 grandson, my youngest grandson, he he had a hard time uh, last year. Um, with school and stuff like that. And I just kept playing games with them and helped build his confidence. Last year, he made straight A's. His, you know why? His confidence changed. Now when we play, like I play business board games with my grandsons and they're nine and 11. Well, now they're nine, 10, 11. And, and then they're buddies and the other one's four years old. We can't wait to get him involved. We play business games where now he knows that, oh, Papa, it's not about having how much money. It's how many businesses can we own? So people pay us while we do this, this and that. But it still come down to his belief. 
because he struggled with the game until his belief changed. And so it's no different in life for you, 31 years old. You're building this podcast. You're building this brand. You're building this following. And you got to see it completely different than everybody else. You're going to get criticized. People are going to tell you you suck. People are going to hate half of this interview. Another people going to ha- like half of it. But what the hell? We're going to keep going, right? That's what you got to do. For me, I played college soccer. I played D1 at Drexel. Ended my career on a knee injury. But I always struggled with belief issues. And, you know, every new level tests a new version of you, right? Yes. It's like I knew I could play college. I knew I could play D1. But I always hedged. I never – could I play pro? And what I've learned, what I do now, and where my belief now comes from, because it's hard to believe before you get somewhere, right? When you're there, okay. It comes from my work. And hard work is relative, but the way I define work for me now is keeping the promises that I make for myself. If I say I'm going to exercise you know, for now, that's actually half, in my book. What you keeping the say, promises? Keep the promises you made to yourself. It's in my book. And take it from me, guys, people listening, uh, that the ones that have loved the interview, the ones that have not liked it, send me a message. Uh, <laughs> I struggled with confidence and it's changed my life. If all I've done was just stack the promises I keep to myself day after day and confidence followed. It was, it was a fascinating concept. And now I kind of feel a little bit more empowered to share it with others because I, I see how it's changed my life. Yeah, here's, here's the thing, too, that that for those who are looking, who struggle with their belief in their business, their company, their podcast, their YouTube channel, whatever the heck you're doing, guys, you know what you do? Start measuring the small wins because everybody focuses on the giant win. They focus on that. You know what I did? Here's what I did. I never missed a workout. Something as simple as I took it all the way down to, the, okay, they have the doors open for workouts. I went to 600 straight voluntary workouts. They had my workout book posted on the wall in there until they changed a lot of the people around and stuff like that. But my workout book was there, 600 voluntary. They used to pay people half a million dollar bonuses to go to workouts. They said, well, why why do you go and you don't get a bonus? I said, because I put it in my core that if I don't show up every single day, that they're going to fire me. So I was drastic with it. If I don't show up today, they're going to fire me. Not that they're going to demote you or you're not going to play. No, I'm going to get fired. So I'm going to be unemployed. Now I got to explain this to my kids. Not acceptable. So at least showing up and, like you say, keeping the promises you make to yourself. And th- this is how you build confidence. This is how you build belief. This is how you build momentum is start documenting the small wins. Did you show up today? Did you work out like you said you were going to work out? Like you're saying, right? You said you were going to run a mile. Did you only go half a mile? No, your ass need to do the mile. Even if you have to walk the other half, make sure that the the the, the, the the, the run outside your neighborhood or on the treadmill or wherever it is, make sure that thing hits a mile. Then you get yourself off. Trust me, those little things are so powerful. They are. They are. Let's wrap with this. That was my favorite part of this, of this show. Uh, I appreciate you sharing. Uh, you gave, you gave, you let Brian Mitchell have it. And you're an NFL guy, but let's talk a little bit about the Sixers. And, and let's say you were brought in as the general manager, the coach to fix that team. What do you say to that team and maybe specifically Ben Simmons, if, if you want to share? I, I like I say, my thing is, is I never try to knock an athlete because I can't do what the hell Ben Simmons does. But one thing I can see, there's a disconnect because and I've heard this on several shows and I'm just based on what I've seen. He hadn't gotten better shooting the basketball. You're making 15, 20 million dollars a year. I'm not worried about him on defense. I'm not worried about him being a team player. I'm worried about him putting the ball in the basket from outside of four feet. But how many shots are you taking? See, that comes down to Ben on a personal level. He can't have somebody in his ear telling him, we're going to get rid of you to do that. You've been in the league, I think this is what, his fifth year? Mm -hmm. Fourth or fifth year in the league. They're depending on you to get to the next level to get a championship. How many shots are you really taking? And, you know, I know these guys have these closed door workouts and things like that, but he maybe need to film them to let people see him making taking shots, regardless if they go in. Because today's generation, they get embarrassed very easily. They get their feelings hurt too damn easy. You know what? I'm going to let y'all see me putting in this work that I'm working on my game yep. to help my team. And from an organization standpoint, you got to look up and down the roster, but you also got to look at, like you said, I think you guys said it uh uh, what Cage was saying as well, you got to look at the organization. Who's calling the shots? How is this organization set up? I, I Doc Rivers to me is one of the one of the best coaches who's been around for a long time. But I also saw, saw, saw a stat last night that Doc Rivers has been to fifteen, I think, 
Eastern uh, like to the semifinals like 15 times, yep. like most of NBA history. And so he's been in games. He's been in like 30 game sevens and he won half of them. So yeah, exactly. Cup, like cup half full, I guess. But see, <laughs> here's the thing. It's not, I, I don't think it's a knock necessarily on Doc, but what part of the organization and the culture does he not control? You see what I'm saying? And because somebody above him is probably making a call on who they get, he's just kind of organizing pieces that somebody else gives him. And that can be difficult for, for a coach. Uh, and that one thing I like about Coach Shanahan is when Coach Shanahan came, Mr. Bowling kind of gave him free reign to undo the organization and help put it back together. And when he did that, of course, what happened? Success happened. And, and that's the way it works in, in pro sports. And so as a GM, trust me, it's, it's not easy, but there's going to be some dismantling that has to take place. If you're not holding that trophy at the end of the year, every team does it. I'm a believer in human potential. And when I see a lack of improvement, I'm never going to criticize someone. I've learned – it's really careful. Like I, I'm, I'm in yeah. media business. I don't want to criticize someone. I don't know what they do in their life. How can I judge? But I'll tell you, there's definitely someone near them that knows – and show me the entire day of this person, and I'll tell you the results. If you show me their day, I'll tell you their results. And uh, that's what I'm curious about. Yeah. You know, everybody say success leaves clues and, and, and you, your, your life is kind of combined by the habits that you perform every single day. You know, what do you get up doing? What do you get up thinking? You know what I'm saying? One thing I, I, I teach people, I say, you know what? You got to learn how to think. They're like, what do you mean? How do you learn how to think? I said, successful people think in a different format. Most people are looking for the problem and we're looking for the solution. We're constantly looking for the solution. And then once we find a solution, we're trying to make that better. We're trying to make it easier and more duplicatable as possible so we can pass it on to teach somebody else. Now we can get out of the way and go do something else. It's constant. It's that constant thing. Like I say, we, we, we were talking about Ben. We we figure the free throws and, the, and, and, he, and his jump shot, if he even has a jump shot, you don't know. I just see him do layups and dunks. That's it. But but I know this man can play. You don't get to that level of the NBA without having the skill set. Um, and it's just a matter of – it's a confidence thing. Can I start with these six- and eight-foot shots – and knock down 100 of them every single day in five different spots. And then I'm going to move out to 12 feet. Then I'm going to move out to 15 feet. The three might not be his game. You don't have to have the three in your game. Steph Curry made everybody think they can shoot the three. You don't <laughs> need to, shoot to be a great player in the NBA. Um, Paul, uh, what's the name? Uh, Chris Paul don't shoot a ton of threes. But Chris Paul, the mid, right there at the elbow, trust me, I'm a Nuggets fan. Chris Paul, right there at the elbow, 46. I think he had like 20 shots in a row that he made in one spot. I'm like, how the hell you let him get to that spot? I'm going to make him go the other way, right? But that guy mastered that mid-range game that you don't see a lot of the guys trying to do because they're trying to make the highlight shot. Everybody wants the highlight shot. Rod, what would you – and I'll wrap with this. I mean, I was going to ask you, what's one piece of advice you'd have for the younger generation? You, we just captured it there. Yeah. What's it like to see a point guard as a center in Nikola Djokic? That's just got to blow your mind, right? Like the Man, game's changed. I, I, uh, I, I got me. Uh, I was really hoping for us to be battling for the West. Uh, people say, "Oh, you're only a Nuggets fan because you live in Denver." Yes, and your point. So I was with the Nuggets when they had Melo. We were not even going to the playoffs, and Melo came, and we started going to the playoffs. And the uh, Western champion. Uh, I was sitting courtside next to the owner in one of the Western uh, games against the Lakers. We ended up losing that. But uh, Jokic is just man. It's just amazing to watch this young man. Uh, he's a, such a team player, though. You know what I'm saying? He really puts everything as far as team, and they feed him, you know, and, and for him to be able to handle that, uh, you know, as a young guy and, and, and be a superstar in the league, MVP, uh, that whole thing is just amazing, man. And uh, for, for me, being a former pro athlete here in Denver, to watch the dynamics of the game now and see how the organization, you know, you know, uh, you know Jamal Murray as well, man. These And the, the team they put around, they're a bunch of young guys. They play defense. Yep. They're not like most NBA teams who say, let's just outscore everybody. They actually work their tail off on defense and got a great uh, supporting cast. I love the what the, the, the Nuggets have done. And Coach Malone, to me, is, uh, you know, he, for, for what he's working with, you know, because we're kind of a smaller market team. We're not the yep. huge, you know, your New Yorks and, you know, these types of, you know, your, 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 your California teams, your L.A.s and all that. But – we are blue collar. They they remind me of the Broncos just with a basketball. They they're blue collar. They're hard workers, and, and Jokic is a star, man, for us. And and we're gonna keep riding him. And I think he's the guy that you can definitely put that tag on. That he's a he's worth, um, you know, modeling for some of you young guys who are trying to make it in sports. You got to pick these guys to model, 
uh, who got good character too, not just a good yep. results for the game. Their character is what creates the game for them. I totally agree. And I think it would have been a different series if uh, Murray was was there because I, I like Michael Porter Jr., but he, he's not ready to be a two. It's tough. He's young. Uh, he, he hasn't had a full season under his belt. Yeah. No, he, you know what? He gave us some points that – but if Murray's there, it's a completely different threat uh, for us. And Michael Porter, I think, even though his points went up like over double digits increase, I think his overall game would have been better with a guy like Murray running the point. Yeah. And, and I can tell you the backup point guards we had did a great job, though. They they did, you know, according to what we needed them to do. Um, we, we just ran into some firepower, man, with Phoenix. Those dudes, they just – they on a whole nother level right now. They're on a mission. I'll tell you a funny story real quick, and I'll let you go. So that, that, that uh, Western Conference Finals, you played the Lakers. Kobe, right? Yeah. With the late, great Kobe. Uh, Kobe was my model, by the way, ever since he was th- – since I was 13. Um he was so mad at George Carl that game because George Carl benched him in the fourth quarter of the All Star game. <laughs> so there's a funny interview I was listening, and I was that like, "What happened?" <laughs> yeah, that's what he said. But they, you know, they these guys they always are looking for for an edge, a little an angle. Uh, so that was a cool story. Rod, thank you so much. I appreciate it. this. was one of my favorite interviews. I learned a lot. I know the people in the audience have learned a lot. Uh, God bless. Any any place that people could find you, follow you, anything you have coming up that you'd want to share with, with our community? Yeah, no, I mean, yes. um, they can get the book. I have an email uh, ebook. You can download the book for free. Uh, I think it's the rodeffectbook.com. If you scroll down a the page, there's a free book. I'm about to change that website. Uh, Lily have sold a lot of those books. You know, if you want a physical hard copy, I personalize it to everybody. If you, if you choose to buy one or a package or whatever, um, my thing is, I think I'm on Rod Smith 80 on Instagram. You, you, you'll see it's a very, it's verified, uh, on Twitter. Um, I'm on there. I don't, I'm not on Twitter a ton, but Instagram, Facebook a little bit, I guess I'm not huge on, on the social media stuff. I love, um, you know, supporting other people, other people's businesses, you know, with just, if it's not information with my money, I buy people's products and they don't, they're like, dude, I can't believe you bought this from me. I said, you know what, man, you're an up and coming entrepreneur. I want to support you and I support you with my dollars, not just with my words. And if it's an up and coming uh, athlete, I try to drop wisdom on them where they can actually last, man, and survive. Because being in athletics, college, high school, pros, it's tough, man. And and so if somebody tells you it's easy, they're lying. I promise you they're lying. Regardless of how talented you are, and I tell people all the time, talent alone is not enough. You got to learn the skills at your craft in order to be great. Rod, it's been a pleasure. Cage, don't worry about it. We took care of everything. Today, you're the true father's day. You have two kids. <laughs> Leah's graduating, so shout out to you, my friend. That, for sure. I heard. I'm never going to live this down, Rod. Rod, I'm never going to live this down because you went into goals with this man. He asked me every day what my goal is, and I'm one of those lost old men that doesn't have a goal. I just live in the moment. I heard the whole thing, man. He's never going to – he's like Rod Smith, two-time Super Bowl champion. He says the same exact thing that I say to you, you all the time. You got to have a target. How are you going to hit a target I'm if you never, never said it? You guys are right. <laughs> you know what? And, and, this, and this, here's the thing. You, you I, don't have, built your I can't hit targets. <laughs> now, you probably built your life to a point where you can do that, which is fine. But I just tell people a lot of times, how are you going to hit something if you never said it? You can't say, I want to go here if you never literally identify what it looks like. Because you'll never know if you arrived. You never know. If, like even with your guys' podcast, maybe there's a certain number of followers you want, but you got to at least write that down and see it every day and watch how much faster that business starts to grow. I tell people that, man, it ain't that easy. I said, yes, it is. You don't believe it. And that's why it doesn't work. If you believe it, it's going to switch. It's just, it's just way business success for me. That's the way it's been for me. It's definitely not easy, but it's definitely been worth it to to go dive all in on what you believe. Do you think it makes sense to have two goals? So, like, I have a big goal that I want to be a part of a network where I could help and inspire people. Short-term no, no, no. goal and practical. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I want to. I want to ins- have a hundred passionate, loyal fans. I want to build a community of a thousand true fans. Absolutely, a thousand true fans. I, I have a, a program I'm releasing here pretty soon, and a thousand true fans. The video of a thousand true fans is actually a part of my course, and that's what people don't understand. You can have this big giant goal. Here's the thing: you got to chop that thing down into bite-sized pieces, like we talked about earlier. That's how you build momentum. That's how you build confidence. That's how you build belief. If you're a teacher, you don't get to teach at a PhD level. No, you start in high school, then you work your way up to college, and you grow into those things. And so business success, athletics, uh, parenting, 
it's all the same. I'm, I'm readjusting how I'm parenting with my grandsons versus how I parented my own kids. It's completely different because the world is different. They don't want to be athletes. You know what they want to be? Damn YouTubers. So you know what I got to do? Go study YouTube to help my grandson understand YouTube versus helping him understand how to run a seven route. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it's a different deal. If he ever wants to get on a call, the three of us, the four of us, and talk about YouTube, we're learning too, but it could be fun. Yeah. And let me give a shout out to our, our sponsor, HGA, <laughs> uh, back to like the thousand true fans. They could open this queue up and they could let in a cage. I'm, I'm, you see how I, I weave? Uh, they could let in a thousand people to, to submit cards and all that stuff, hundreds of thousands. But the, I think they're doing a great job as well of building that true community. So shout out to our sponsor, Hybrid Grading. Yeah, no, I, I, I like I say again, thank you guys for having me on. Um, I don't do a lot of these, but I, I it really gets me excited because I get to go back to you know a passion. Playing football was a passion of mine. I tell people I would do it for free. I said I, I gave them everything I had for the 14 years I did it. I don't regret one second of my NFL career, not one. Even when I dropped the pass, which rarely happened, but it did happen, right? But uh, times we lost tough games, but the times we won, I, I appreciate it and I, and I love every moment of it.